Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Okay, so today is um, the fifth webinar in a five-session webinar strand using Universal Design for Learning to support Tier 1 instruction. Today's topic is Guideline Exploration of UDL Concepts. We're very excited to have back with us um, two UDL implementation specialists from CAST, Melissa Sanjay and Bill Wilmot. And at this time, it's my pleasure to welcome back Melissa and Bill. Hello. Um, I am echoing to myself. I will soldier through if um, it's not causing a distraction for others. Tamara and um, Jennifer, are you getting an echo? Okay, so it looks like Molly's. Oh, Tamara's getting an echo. Jennifer is not, and Molly is not. So oh, that's interesting. Um, and Bill, you're all muted, and I'm all muted. So I'm not sure why it's doing that. Did you? All right, so um, I'm just going to start. Hello. So thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry for all of the sorry for all of the um, technical problems, but we and we've got a lot of content today, so. We'll get started. Again, my name is Melissa Sanjay, and I am here with my colleague, Bill, who is on the chat. Um, my echo is gone now, uh, so um, I think we'll be good as far as that's concerned. And Bill, maybe just so that we stay in this not um, non-echo space, I will introduce you for you so you don't have to unmute your phone. Um, uh, so Bill and I are both implementation specialists, and we work with schools in New Hampshire, and we help them implement universal design for learning. Uh, Bill is going to be in the chat interacting with folks, and so make sure to say hi to him down there. All right, so our options for today are you can um, follow this, this presentation. You can follow it here. You can also, it's going to be recorded. You can watch it back. And I also think the slides may be on the website. Um, there is, in this slide, an incorrect bit.ly. Um, we didn't do a bit.ly this time, so just ignore that bit.ly. That was my mistake. Um, and your options for expression are um, to stand, sit, walk, stretch, run around. We can't see what you're doing. So listen and follow along in whatever way is most comfortable for you. And then take a little bit of time to set up your space and get out all the tools that you might need for expert learning. Some folks like to use colored pencils, fidgets, markers, notebooks, that sort of thing. So get everything you need um, to get down to learning. So our goals for today are we gonna, we're going to review um, as quickly as possible the foundational concepts of UDL. We're going to understand the development of the CAS guidelines, and then we're going to explore each principle we're going to try a design activity using the guidelines and then explore strategies for each guideline. So right now, before we begin, I um, also want you to take a minute and think about your personal and professional goals for today. What do you want to get out of this session? And if you could type it in the chat, um, we will we want to get our brains set on a goal so that we can best learn. So just take a minute to express that goal. Oh, and Bill, thank you so much. He put the links to the slides there. So, um, and that will help you in, um, if you want to go back and review any of the videos and that sort of thing as well. So Jennifer is always trying to increase knowledge. That's a great goal. She wants to get some new information. Anybody else want to share a goal? OK, I'm going to move us on, see if we can kind of catch up on some time. Oh, Bill's goal is he would like to zoom in on one guideline that he's not focused on as much, language and symbols. So he's going to get some, some information today about that and then zoom in a little bit more. And Tamara is going to increase her background and training. So we are here as part of a larger series on um, RTI and um, MTSS. And so we wanted to kind of explain how universal design works in. Universal Design Tier 1 instruction is a great way to serve as many students as possible in Tier 1 so that all students have access. But we also like to remind folks that 
when you have Tier 2 interventions and Tier 1 interventions for some of those um, more specific needs, you also want to make sure to make those as universally designed as possible. So UDL should be weaving all through your RTI or MTSS programs. And we want to make sure that our curriculum and all of our tiered interventions are accessible for all of our learners. So when we talk about um, UDL, we always go over the core concepts. And our first core concept comes from architecture. We spent some time during our first session talking about um, closed captioning, talking about ramps, talking about designing spaces so that everyone can get in. And from that, from that um, framework, we can come to our first core concept of UDL, which is the bar barrier is in the environment and not the learner. We're always removing barriers from the environment, and um, it is the barrier that is not accessible. It's not the learner that's broken. Our second core concept comes from neuroscience, and we spent some time in our first and even our second session talking about um, the neuroscience and how there is no average brain. All brains are different. And what we find from the neuroscience is that variability is the norm. The one thing you can count on is learners are variable. And so we get to, from there, our last core concept, which is the UDL guidelines, which is what we'll be spending a lot of time on today. And the UDL guidelines, the goal of all the things that we do in our CAST UDL guidelines is uh, in service of expert learning. So the goal of UDL is to develop expert learners. So those are our core concepts. So when CAST decided they wanted to do a framework uh, such that it can make it easier for teachers to organize their interventions and organize their strategies and organize the way that they do UDL. Um, they went to several sources. They, they went to modern research in the learning sciences, cognitive sciences, cognitive neuroscience, neuropsychology and neuroscience. And I think that that link there is clickable. So you can click that, and you're going to get all of the background of all the research that CAS went over. And um, you, can, you can go through and look at that on your, at your leisure. It also should be in the Google Doc. It's clickable there as well. And they'll also put it in the, the link in the chat. So you have many ways that you can access that information. So the first stage of, as I looked at all of these, all of this research and all of these papers, the first stage they asked themselves is, what are the range and sources of human variance and learning? And from that, they came up with the three principles. And these three principles, they go across three networks. So we may have gone over this in a previous webinar, but just as a quick reminder, if you look at your brain, and this might be it's backwards on my webcam. I don't know if I'm backwards on yours. But the front of your brain is where um, the action and expression happens. It's your strategic network. It's where, you, um, it's where you make your plans to act on things. So this is what we kind of refer to as the how of learning. How am I going to show what I know? The back of your brain is the representation, net, the representation principle, but it is the sensory network where you're bringing in all of that information through your eyes, through your nose. You're bringing in all of that information through your ears and making sense of it in the representation um, principle and in the sensory network. And then in the middle of your brain is the affective network, um, where your feelings, your, your emotions, that sort of thing are. And um, that is the, what we call the why of learning. And we call that the engagement principle around why do I want to do this? Why, why am I interested in this? Why, why should I do this activity that my teacher has um, asked me to do? So um, that, that engagement net principle or the, the effective network that monitors our internal and external environments, sets our priorities, our motivations, and it really tells us how is the student going to engage in this learning process. As I said, the representation principles where we bring in all that information and we're really asking ourselves how will the students perceive and then the action expression, how will they act on their understanding. So just another, um, this is just another representation, another way of looking at it. So stage two, they ask themselves, 
what are the essential components to supporting variance within each of these networks, so within the engagement, representation, and action expression? What are the essential components to supporting variance? And then they came up with those, um, each of those boxes. So each of those boxes we call guidelines. So the columns we call um, networks or principles, and the boxes we call guidelines. And so the boxes are things like recruiting interest or options for perception, options for physical action. And then the last thing they asked themselves is they wanted to drill down even further and get even more specific. And they asked themselves, what are the specific practices that we can do day to day as a learner, as a teacher, in each of these principles that will reduce barriers to learning? And those are what we call checkpoints. Those are our 31 checkpoints. So there's a lot of content in this, um, in, in this, in this framework that you can dig in and be, dig deep into. And again, the goal of all UDL and the goal of all of those checkpoints and the reason we do any of this is because we want to develop expert learners, students who are purposeful purposeful, motivated, resourceful, and knowledgeable, and strategic and goal-directed. What is also interesting about the UDL guidelines is not only do they go up and down in each of the networks or principles, but they go across. So if you look at the guideline website, and maybe um, Bill could post that link for us to the interactive guidelines there in the chat, and you can poke around in it. Um, but when you go in there, you will see that the top row, that top row says access. So that top row are things that teachers mostly can do that they can um, take action on to help a student to reduce barriers. The middle row, we call it the build, the build row, and it is the teacher and student interactions, things that they both can interact with um, in order to help a student build their understanding of a topic. And the last thing is the internalized row. And those are often things that students decide themselves. They make their choices there. They're student-led. Students um, can make how they're going to, to handle some of those things. They can make those decisions. And that's the student-led role, and that's the internalized, where students start to internalize their learning. And as we know, um, one of the big quotes around CAST is, all learning is the interaction between the learner and the environment. So these are things that we can do to set up the environment so that the student can have access to, to that knowledge, with the goal being developing expert learners who are purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable, and strategic and goal-directed. So I want us to take a second to reflect. Um, ask ourselves, when have you been an expert learner, and what did that look like? And write that down in the chat, or write it in a, in a, um, in a notebook. So let's think about ourselves first. What are we, when we've been an expert learner, what did that look like? I know for me, sometimes um, when I'm an expert learner, it looks more messy than I want it to look, or I kind of go down rabbit holes, and then I make a decision that that might not be the best strategy for me, or that might not be the best area, and then I kind of back back out, and I go down again. Um, so it's not always, it's not always, um, it's not always pretty <laughs> when I'm trying to be an expert learner. Uh, Bill says when he bought an outboard motor, and had to repair the gear shift level, he had to figure out using all the tools that he could find. Yes, we have uh, that around my house too. That is how I lost a pair of kitchen shears because it cut a, uh, a tube inside of an engine. Um, and Bill also said when he took it apart, he created more problems for himself and then felt motivated to figure it out. Yes, yes, sometimes that does happen that way. Samara says when she's lost in her learning, when she's investigating, when she's an expert learner. Yes, I get that way too. I have to solve a problem. I have to follow it through to the end. Thank you for your responses. Okay, so now that we've thought about ourselves and how we look as expert learners, what do we expect from our students? What do we want our students to do? And how do we um, 
see them as expert learners? What are they doing when, when they are doing what we want them to do and being expert learners? Sometimes when I think about students in a classroom, um, I think early on I always wanted some more things to line up. I wanted the pencils out and I wanted the pencils on the paper at the same time. So, um, so sometimes that's what I've expected. And then I came to learn that um, learning can look a lot more messy. When learning's happening, it's not always clean. And I get that from my own experience. But I like to when they have a plan or a goal, something to achieve. Yes. And when they've developed that plan or a goal themselves, and they know what they're doing, and they know which strategy they're going to use, that's always pretty awesome. Bill says, supporting students through the messiness can be very valuable, and then finding ways to work towards goals. Yes. And help, that will help them in the future. Uh, get themselves through the messiness. All right, thank you for the conversation. We're going to do a little overview of each of the networks, and we're going to start in the engagement principle. Um, when I did the, the brain, I kind of went backwards, but uh, we always do like to start in the engagement principle because engagement is very important, and um, I want us to listen to a talk um, and I didn't Your start microphone has been turned on. Oh, my computer just said my microphone has been turned on. So, uh, Molly, let me know if something's going wrong. Put no, that's chat. the I'm unmuted. Oh. So I can do the video for you. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, I was going to say on the video what her uh, what her name is, um, and I don't want to get it wrong. So, I'm going to let the video pronounce it for you. So, we'll watch this video and then I'll come back. I'm going to mute myself so it doesn't echo. Me the sound is okay. Here we go. California, and I study the ways in which children can both. that undergirds their learning so that they can learn better into the future. And I'm going to start my talk with a picture of my children's jack-o'-lanterns, some of you may know. And the reason is that I think that the jack-o'-lanterns are really fantastic visual metaphors of how children learn. Inside of each one of those little pumpkins is a fire burning, a fire that consumes oxygen and that shines out through that child's actions and through that child's um, beliefs and through that child's learning in the world. And so historically we thought, and scientists even thought, that emotions interfere with clear-headed thinking. That is, to learn well, we needed to get our emotions out of our thought. We needed to take ourself out of it. We needed to take our feelings out of it. And instead just focus in a kind of pure way on the cognitive skill that we're trying to develop. And what we're learning with our new neuroscientific research, is that nothing could be further from the truth in the way that And this makes good sense evolutionarily because the ordinary purpose of our brain is to keep us alive. It's to steer our actions and our thoughts and behaviors so that we remember the things that matter, so that we learn the things that we think are going to need in the future. And we don't attend to or spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff that we think doesn't matter or that we think is not important. To demonstrate what I mean, I have a little poem written by a kindergartner about her baby brother named Theodore. She calls him Teddy. And you can see a little picture of her up here with her little pink dress and crayon. And underneath, she's written out her poem. And it says, oh, Teddy, we love you more than the whole earth size. As the earth spins, every day we love you. 
love you as much as usual, but sometimes even more, as you make us proud and happy that you're you. I have a simple question for you. Is that a poem about this little girl's love for her baby brother? Or is that a poem about her budding knowledge of planetary science? Our emotions and our relationships and our cultural experiences in the social world literally organize and shape the development of brain networks that allow us to learn. Over the course of the morning, you're going to hear from my colleagues about their work describing how children's identities, how children's emotional experiences and the learning environments they're exposed to are influencing what they're capable of doing. And I want you to take this information very seriously. Because this isn't just sort of a, a, a recent fad about how people learn to make people happier or something like that. This is literally shaping and changing and recruiting brain networks for memory and emotion that will not be recruited any other way. Fully neurobiologically impossible to think about things deeply or to remember things about which you've had no emotion. I'm going to show you next a picture of the human brain in an inspired learning space. And the orange dots, the orange spots that appear on this brain in a moment represent the places in a person's brain where there is statistically more blood flow and reliably more neural activity and firing when people are learning information that they find inspirational, that they're telling us in the moment makes them deeply reflective about what it means, about who they are, and about how they're going to use that information in the future, as compared to when they're learning things that don't feel inspirational to them, that feel sort of detached and not that relevant and not that important. And what I want you to notice is that not only are there massive orange activations, huge areas and swaths of activation up at the level of the cortex, all this folded up stuff at the top that we're so proud of having so much more of than apes, right? But that actually inspired learning activates all the way to the bottom of the field of view of our scanner. If you look in the middle of this image, there's a kind of a white stalk that heads down. That's your brain stem. That part of our brain we share with all vertebrates. Alligators have a gorgeous one of these, right? And we've thought over time that inspired learning is involving only these high-level, complex networks for thinking about and deliberating on information. But in fact, what happens is that the outcome of those deliberations is literally feeding itself down all the way into the brainstem mechanism that keep you alive. Those regions in the middle of that brainstem and all the way to the bottom control things like consciousness, like literally if you damage them, you get coma. And at the very bottom, that orange spot at the very bottom in what we call the medulla is just above that little thread of spinal cord. If you get damaged there, we cannot even keep you alive on life support. Your heart stops beating, you stop breathing, and your physiology becomes completely dysregulated. How powerfully this image speaks to the need for the personal, emotional, deeply relevant, culturally situated way in their learning experience. From the very beginning of our lives, we learn in cultural and emotional and socially subjective ways. We situate ourselves inside of relationships. And those relationships are nested inside of bigger and bigger spheres of relationships that organize and influence the way in which we think and learn. Our emotions and our relationships and our social situatedness and immaterial that support all children optimally so that they're capable of thinking. All right. Um, thank you for sharing that with us, Molly. So um, I wanted to just do a little bit of reflecting on this. So 
Uh, is there anything that surprised you about the content or what most resonated with you? And I'll give a little tiny bit of an overview because it was a little choppy for me, but the big takeaway from this video is that we can't do any learning if uh, we do not engage uh, emotionally into, into the learning, if our effective network is not activated. Not only is it more difficult for students to learn, but it is almost impossible for them to transfer that learning to someplace outside of the classroom environment. So um, that is a, the big takeaway of this um, work by Imodorino Yang. I always get her name right, so I thought I'd try. So, um, so Bill said it's amazing how interconnected their brains are. Love the idea that there is no engagement or connection to learning without the effective engagement. Yes. And uh, we probably see that in our classrooms on a daily basis. But that's why that engagement and that effective network is important. And that's why it takes up an entire principle. Because even though they used to tell us when we were younger, you know, check your feelings at the door, now what we know about neuroscience is we have to feel. Um, we have to be engaged. Um, our effective network has to be engaged in order to learn. So we'll move on to the representation principle. And we're going to go through um, these three representations of, um, of a piece of music. And the goal of this, um, the goal of this activity is for you to try to remember the notes and the notes relation to each other and the rhythm. So I'm going to let Molly play. It's just that Your we're microphone has been turned on. I'm going to listen to a minute of it, and then um, so I'm just going to leave my webcam up. Can't find it. Sorry about that, I lost it. Bear with me. Today is the day of technical. <laughs> it's like a national holiday. I know. Six years of doing webinars, and all of a sudden I'm going to have them all today. Okay, hold on a second. Let me get let me share this. There we go. All right, thank you, Molly, for that. Um, so think about the goal of, our, of why we listen to that and think to yourself, like, could, just having listened to that, could you um, tell me a little bit about the notes, the rhythm of the notes, uh, where they are on a scale, what their relation to one another is? Um, anybody feel like they got it, like they could just listen and they're, they're ready to go? <laughs> Phil emphatically says, no, he does not quite have it yet. So then our second representation is uh, a piece of sheet music. So take a look at that. Now we can see a little bit more about the rhythm. We can see a little bit more about, you know, how they're situated on the scale, their relation to one another. 
Um, but if you do not know how to read music and you do not have that fluency, you might not know that uh, a note with an extra line on it is a little bit shorter than the note with just one line on it, which is a little bit shorter than the note that doesn't have a flag. You wouldn't know that um, if you didn't know how to read music. So then we'll go to our last representation, unless everybody's got it. Does anybody want to say, no, I got it now? All right, so we'll go to our last representation. And this is another video, so I'm going to ask Molly to play just about a minute of that. All right, thank you, Molly. So that one was a, uh, a little bit more clear. You could see where the notes fell on the keyboard. You could see uh, what I really liked about that was how you could see when the ones would build this note, that note, and we got three notes, four notes, five notes. Um, but I want us to take a second and reflect which representation worked for us and why. Uh, did a combo work for you? Uh, can you think of another way to represent this context? And did you see any barriers um, in that exercise? So just stick it in the chat. Let us know some of your reflections on that activity. goal, Bill would like a reminder of what the goal was. The goal was to understand a little bit about uh, where the notes were in their relation to one another and how short or long the notes were. It was something about the rhythm. So for me, I think the, the last one worked the best, although I did like the combo because I can remuse it. Um, and it looks like Bill, or Jennifer also liked the last piece of the visual of the keys. Bill said he really liked the last uh, representation showing the rhythm visually. Yeah, and I like to be able to hear it and watch it as it went, because I tend to be more audio. Um, I tend to take things more in through my ears. However, um, to see it kind of like laid against one another, both the visual and the and the audio, and Bill agrees with that. The Tamara says the last was the best, the repetition helped. And that is a very good point, Tamara. And so sometimes students will need one way or another. And in a lot of ways, a lot of times it takes more than one representation for all of us to make connections um, between and even within concepts. So um, excellent point. Sometimes more than one for each individual is helpful. All right, so now we're going to move on to our action and expression principle. And remember, this is the strategic network. And this is how we show what we know. And this is how we act on our understandings. And we're going to watch this short. I think it's a three-minute video. I'm watching the timer at five times. So I think we're doing all right. But um, this is a three-minute video about Stephen. So if uh, Molly could show Your us that. Your microphone has been turned on.
drawing of New York City from the memory. I feel excited. The beautiful city. Lots of those skyscrapers. My favorite is uh, the Empire State Building. It's a brilliant building. So this morning I figured it out. We'll start with the Brooklyn, up to the Midtown Manhattan, all the way to Queens. And start now. I would love to be in his mind to actually see how he sees things. That was actually an advertisement for, I think, a British bank. But um, I chose that video because it was the shortest one um, that showed us, Stephen. Um, I don't know if everyone could hear it, uh, but he was mute, mute for the first part of his life. So I want us to reflect and think, what if Stephen was limited to one aspect of expression? And I thought to myself, what if I, um, oh, I should share my webcam. I thought to myself, what if, what if I, as a teacher, asked him to describe to me uh, the relationship of, you know, of space or some, some things about geometry, and he was only allowed to express that to me verbally? Would I know what he could do about, or what, would I know what he could do or what his knowledge of spatial relations was, um, given that he can look at a cityscape and recreate it with the exact amount of windows and the exact amount of spaces. Uh, so given your experience in schools, what resonates with you about this? Um, anything, anything just making folks think about something, to remind you of a student you know? Share those things in the chat. Bill said he always has to ask questions and investigate what students are doing and thinking. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think that sometimes it's, um, it's beyond some of what Bill talk, talked about in the last one about a teacher as a coach. Sometimes it's beyond even um, just offering options. It's about coaching students to what option will um, help them best demonstrate their knowledge. Uh, yeah, Bill said there's often so much going on inside of their heads. Jennifer says all students have different strengths. Uh, and his attention to detail is amazing, Jennifer, I agree. Um, and he, there's more than one video about him on the internet. You can check that one with New York. He did um, Paris, I think, in one of the videos. So he, um, he's a very good artist. So uh, we already went over this. This is a slide about what, what are our questions. Uh, so the question is, so what? So we have these three different representation, action and expression, engagement. We have these three principles. What are we going to do about it? Well, how does that help us knowing that students are variable within those principles? So, so what is the UDL, if the UDL framework is a framework. It's not a checklist. So we certainly don't want folks going and sitting down with that, with that document and saying, OK, I've got to do this, 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 and this, because that uh, will be not only crazy making, but it's going to be overwhelming for both you and your students. So we ask that you start small. So uh, as Bill suggested in the chat at the beginning, he was thinking about zeroing in on one guideline. So maybe that's how you want to do it. Maybe you're saying, I'm just going to think about recruiting interest uh, in my lessons this month. But make sure to start small. Make small changes, because small changes make a big difference, even if you're offering two options to complete an assignment for a while to kind of see how that works and uh, figure out what your learners are doing and how that's working for them. So when we think about engagement, um, one of the things, when it's sort of a low lift to do in the very beginning is maybe offer a choice of two relevant texts when you're um, doing a writing assignment or reading assignment. If you think about representation, um, you can do things like record uh, on a voice recorder that students can listen to after the lesson. You can give out digital copies where students can blow things up and uh, make, them, make them smaller or highlight them can read aloud and have them follow along. And then in terms of the action and expression principle um, and how students will act on their understanding, some options folks have given is you can draw, you can write, you can speech record, you can do a podcast, you can do an infographic. So what's important about that one in particular, about all of them, is that you have to know your goal. So if, you, if your students can achieve the goal that you've set, the learning objective, via podcast and by a thesis paper, then those are good options. I would like to say a good rule of thumb is if you have a different rubric for every option you're giving in order to complete assignments, then those assignments are addressing, those, those options are addressing different goals. So the rubric should always be the same, and then you can offer, offer options within those goals. So we have... 12 minutes. So I want us to try it. I'm going to go through it a little bit faster than I originally planned. But um, what I want us to try is to look at this standard. And I'll build in some options and, um, and uh, anticipate some barriers. So our standard is going to be use the periodic table as a model to predict a rel relative property of main group of elements. So my goal, I'm going to put. Um, I'm going to put, students will create a cereal box to show understanding of the element. And I want us to go through and think about barriers for engagement, barriers for representation, and barriers for action and expression. And I want you to put in the chat what barriers you think this goal would put up. So. What barriers would a student have to completing this, completing this assignment? So an example of a barrier could be um, maybe a student doesn't like to, to draw, and they have to draw on the the serial box, or could they show their understanding in a different way?
What if I ask the students to bring the cereal box in from home and they don't have cereal? Bill says, what if he doesn't eat cereal? Why a cereal box? Why is that? I'm not interested in cereal. What, what does the cereal box have to do with nitrogen, right? What about representation? Talk a little bit about engagement. Representation. What are the barriers for representation? I don't know. There's some things I don't know about this assignment. If we're reading about the elements, it's but Bill said, are we reading about the elements? Do I have a chart on the wall? Am I listening to my teacher talk to me about the elements? How am I researching? Am I using the internet? Is there more than one way to use the internet? Is there more than one way to get the information? Or do they just have the periodic table with the different um, symbols for what the properties are? And then we talked a little bit about action and expression. Um, what if they don't want to draw? What if they don't like to draw? What if they have fine motor skills issues? So how could we rewrite this lesson to build in some, oh, I just lost my PowerPoint, Molly. Your microphone has been turned on. Sorry, can you click back into it, Melissa? I'm trying. If Bill's still there, he could. No, I lost him, too. But no, Jennifer and Tamara are still on. Thank you. There you are. OK. Sorry about that. I'm back. Oh, and I'm gone again. Oh, no. So why don't we, uh, since we only have eight minutes left, I think what I, we can do is I'll let, the, uh, I'll let you guys know that if you go to those slides and you go to the um, Google Drive, you will see additional slides. And I went through each of the checkpoints and each of the, sorry, I mean each of the guidelines and gave some ideas for things you could do within those guidelines. Bill and I's email address are there, so if you have any questions about that, those things, you could ask us. Um, I'll try one more time, but this happened before, and they kept kicking us out over and over tomorrow and Molly, so I don't want to kind of waste your time as we try to, to jump in. Anything?